Good morning, Grant Elementary Bulldogs. I am going to be reading to you chapters 14 and 15 today. Chapter 14 is called Mr. Willy Wonka. Mr. Wonka was standing all alone just inside the open gates of the factory. And what an extraordinary little man he was. He had a black top hat on his head. He wore a tall tail coat made of a beautiful plum colored velvet. His trousers were bottle green. His gloves were gray. And in one hand, he carried a fine gold topped walking cane. Covering his chin, there was a small, neat, pointed black beard, a goatee. And his eyes, oh, his eyes were most marvelous bright. They seemed to be sparkling and twinkling at you all the time. The whole face, in fact, was filled with fun and laughter. And oh, how clever he looked, how quick and sharp and full of life. He kept making quick, jerky little movements with his head, cocking it this way and that, and taking everything in with those bright, twinkling eyes. He was like a squirrel in the quickness of his movements, like a quick, clever old squirrel from the park. Suddenly, he did a funny little skipping dance in the snow, and he spread his arms wide, and he smiled at the five children who were clustered near the gates, and he called out, Welcome, my friends! Welcome to the factory! His voice was high. Will you come forward at one time, please, he called out, and bring your parents, then show me your golden ticket, and give me your name. Who's first? The big fat boy stepped up. Ah, um, Augustus Galoop, he said. Augustus, cried Mr. Wonka, seizing his hand and pumping it up and down with terrific force. My dear boy, how good to see you. Delighted, charmed, overjoyed to have you with us. And these are your parents? How nice. Come in, come in, that's right. Step through the gates. Mr. Wonka was clearly as excited as everybody else. My name, said the next girl to go forward, is Veruca Salt. <gasps> My dear Veruca, how do you do? What a pleasure it is. You do have an interesting name, don't you? I always thought a Veruca was a sort of wart that you get on the sole of your foot. Hmm, but I must be wrong, mustn't I? How pretty you look in that lovely mink coat. I am so glad you could come. Oh, dear me. This is going to be such an exciting day. I do hope you enjoy it. I am sure you will. I know you will. Your father? How are you, Mr. Salt? And Mr. Salt? Overjoyed to see you? Yes, the ticket is quite in order. Please go in. The next two children, Violet Beauregard and Mike TV, came forward to have their tickets examined and then to have their names practically pumped up off their shoulders by the energetic Mr. Wonka. At last of all, a small, nervous little voice, Charlie Bucket? Charlie, cried Mr. Wonka. Well, well, well. So there you are. You're the one who found your ticket only yesterday, aren't you? Yes, yes. I read all about it in the morning papers. Just in time, my dear boy. I am so glad, so happy for you. And this, your grandfather? Delighted to meet you, sir. Overjoyed. Enchanted. All right. Excellent. Is everybody in now? Five children? Yes. Good. Now, will you please follow me? Our tour is about to begin. But do keep together. Please don't wander off by yourselves. I shouldn't like to lose any of you at this stage of the processing. Oh, dear. Me, no. Charlie glanced over, at his, sh over his shoulder and saw the great iron entrance gate slowly closing behind him. The crowds on the outside were still pushing and shouting. Charlie took a last look at them. Then, as the gates closed with a clang, all sight of the outside world disappeared. Here we are, cried Mr. Wonka, trotting along in front of the group, through the big red door, please. That's right, it's nice and warm inside. I have to keep my my warm inside I have to keep it warm inside the factory because of the workers. My workers are used to the extremely hot climate. 
They can't stand the cold. They'd perish if we went outdoors in this weather. They'd freeze to death. But who are these workers? asked Augustus Gloop. All in good time, my dear boy, said Mr. Wonka, smiling at Augustus. Be patient. You shall see as we all go along. Are all of you inside? Good. Would you mind closing the door? Thank you. Charlie Bucket found himself standing in a long corridor that stretched away in front of him as far as he could see. The corridor was so wide that a car could easily have driven along. The walls were pale pink. The lighting was soft and pleasant. How lovely and warm, whispered Charlie. I know, and what a marvelous smell, answered Papa Joe, taking a long, deep sniff. Oh, all the most wonderful smells in the world seem to be mixed up in the air around them. The smell of roasting coffee and burnt sugar and melting chocolate and mint and violets and crushed hazelnuts and apple blossoms and caramel and lemon peel. And far away in the distance from the heart of the great factory came a muffled roar of energy as though some monstrous gigantic machine was spinning its wheels at breakneck speed. And this my dear children, said Mr. Wonka, raising his voice above the noise. This is the main corridor. Will you please hang your coats and hats on those pegs over there and then follow me. This way. Good. Everyone ready? Come on then. Here we go. He trotted off rapidly down the corridor with his tail of his plum-colored velvet coat flapping behind him and the visitors all hurried after him. It was quite a large party of people. When you came to think of it, there were nine grown-ups and five children, 14 in all. So you can imagine that there was a good deal of pushing and shoving as they hustled and bustled down the passage, trying to keep up with the swift little finger in front of them. Come on, cried Mr. Wonka. Get a move on, please. We'll never get around if you all dwindle, dwindle like this. Soon he turned right off the main corridor into a Another slightly narrow passage, and then he turned left, and then left again, and then right, and then left, then right, then right, then left. The place was a gigantic rabbit warren, with passages leading this way and that in every direction. Don't you let go of my hand, Charlie, whispered Grandpa Joe. Notice how all of these passages are sloping downward, said Mr. Wonka. We are now going underground. All the most important rooms in my factory are deep down below the surface. Why is that, somebody asked. There wouldn't be nearly enough space for them up on top, answered Mr. Wonka. These rooms are going to seem as are enormous. They're larger than football fields. No building in the world could be big enough to house them. But down here, underneath the ground, I've got all the space I want. There's no limit as long as I hollow it out. Mr. Wonka turned right and then left, then right again. The passages were sloping steeper and steeper downhill now. And then suddenly, Mr. Wonka stopped. In front of him, there was a shiny metal door. The party crowded round on the door in large letters. It read, the chocolate room. Chapter 15, The Chocolate Room. An important room this, cried Mr. Wonka, taking a bunch of keys from his pocket and slipping one into the keyhole of the door. This is the nerve center of the whole factory, the heart of the whole business, and so beautiful. I insist upon my rooms being beautiful. I cannot have ugliness in my factories. In we go then, and do be careful, my dear children. Don't lose your heads. Don't get overexcited. Keep very calm. Mr. Wonka opened the door. Five children and nine grown-ups pushed their ways in, and oh, what an amazing sight it was that now their eyes met. They were looking down upon a lovely valley there were green meadows on either side of the valley, and along the bottom of there flowed a great brown river. What, it, what is more, there was a tremendous 
waterfall halfway down the river, a steep cliff over which the water curled and rolled in a solid sheet, and then went crashing down into a boiling, turning whirlpool of froth and spray. Below the waterfall, and this was the most astonishing sight of all, a whole mass of enormous glass pipes were dangling down the river from somewhere high up in the ceiling. They really were enormous, these pipes. There must have been a dozen of them at least, and they were sucking up the brown, muddy water from the river and carrying it away to goodness knows where. And because they were made of glass, you could see the liquid flowing and bubbling along them. And above the noise of the waterfall, you could hear the never-ending suck-sucking sounds of the pipes as they did their work. Graceful trees and bushes were growing along the riverbanks. Weeping willows and adlers and tall clumps of rhododendras and their pink and white and red and mauve blossoms. In the middle, there were thousands of buttercups. There, cried Mr. Wonka, dancing up and down and pointing his gold-topped cane at the great brown river. It's all chocolate. Every drop of that river is hot, melted chocolate of the finest quality. The very finest quality. That's enough. There's enough chocolate in here to fill every bathtub in the entire country. And all the swimming pools as well. Isn't that terrific? And just look at my pipes. They suck up the chocolate and carry it away to all the other rooms in the factory where it needed. Thousands of gallons an hour, my dear children. Thousands and thousands of gallons. The children and their parents were too flabbergasted to speak. They were dumbfounded. They were bewildered and dazzled. They were completely bowled over by the hugeness of the whole thing. They simply stood and stared. The waterfall is most important, Mr. Wonka went on. It mixes the chocolate, it turns it up, it pounds it and beats it. It makes it light and frothy. No other factory in the world mixes chocolate by waterfall, but it's the only way to do it properly. The only way. And do you like my trees? He cried, pointing with his stick. And my lovely bushes? Don't you think they look pretty? I told you I hated ugliness. And of course, they're all eatable. And all made of something different and delicious. And do you like my meadows? Do you like my grass and my buttercups? The grass you are standing on? Oh, my dear little ones. It is made of a new kind of soft, minty sugar that I just invented. And it is called swudge. Try a blade, please do. It's delectable. Automatically, everybody went down and picked one blade of grass. Everyone that is, except Augustus Gloop, who took a handful. And Violet Beauregard, before tasting her blade of grass, took the piece of the world breaking of the world record breaking chewing gum from her mouth and stuck it carefully behind her ear. Isn't it wonderful, whispered Chalkley, Chalk Charlie. Hasn't it got a wonderful taste, Grandpa? I could eat the whole field, said Papa Joe, grinning with delight. I could go around on all fours like a cow and eat every blade of grass in the field. Try a buttercup, said Mr. Wonka. They're even nicer. Suddenly, the air was filled with screams of excitement, the screams from Veruca Salt. She was pointing frantically, frantically to the other side of the river. Look, look, over there, she screamed. What is it? He's moving, he's walking. It's a little person, it's a little man. Down there below the waterfall. Everyone stopped picking buttercups and stared across the river. She's right, Grandpa said Charlie. It is a little man. Can you see him? I see him, Charlie, said Papa Joe excitedly. And now everyone starts shouting at once. There's two of them. Oh my gosh, so there is. There's more than two. There's one, two, three, four, five. What are they doing? Where did they come from? Who are 
are they? Children and parents alike rushed down to the edge of the river to get a closer look. Aren't they fantastic? No higher than my knee. Look at their long, funny hair. The tiny men were no larger than medium-sized dolls, had stopped what they were doing, and now they were staring back across the river at the visitors. One of them pointed towards the children, and then he whispered something to the other four, and all five of them burst into laughter. But they can't be real, Charlie said. Of course they're real, Mr. Wonker answered. They're Oompa Loompas.